Hello and welcome to the 13th Cloudscape devlog. I've made a whole lot of progress and I only covered a small portion of that in the previous devlog. I'd like to use this devlog as a way to just focus on one major feature I've been spending most of my time working on recently, and that's dungeons. I grew up playing the classic Legend of Zelda games and I always really enjoyed how the dungeons were a mixture of combat, puzzles, and obstacles. It really created a sense of adventure and provided different types of challenges all in one tightly packed set of rooms. I knew I wanted to create something similar for Cloudscape as I thought it would be a nice change of pace from the typical dungeons I see in games lately which are mostly entirely combat focused. There were a lot of totally new features and design challenges I'd need to tackle when creating dungeons so I'll break down the process now. First off, since many parts of Cloudscape are all about procedural generation, including the player's island, caves, and other random islands you'll encounter, I thought it was only fitting to continue using procedural generation for dungeons. My idea was to again mix handcrafted levels with a procedural algorithm to create fresh dungeon layouts and totally different challenges so it's possible to experience totally different dungeons with each playthrough. I decided I wanted a dungeon layout made up of many interconnected square rooms. I first needed to create a simple script which could randomly draw a path of rooms to represent the entry point of the dungeon and the final boss room. By creating a path first, it guarantees the player can always go through a series of rooms and reach the end. After I got a path generating, I then proceeded to do another pass where the script will randomly add on more rooms to the path in order to create some variety in different ways of navigating to the end. This was all fairly straightforward to do, and the result was a nice variety of dungeon layouts. The next step was to actually go ahead and give rooms unique IDs to indicate what exactly each room would contain. I narrowed this down to six types of rooms. The Entry Room this will always have a door on the southern wall where the player enters. These rooms may have simple obstacles or puzzles to proceed further into the dungeon, but generally may just be nice open entry areas for the player to prepare for what lies ahead. Puzzle Rooms These rooms, of course, will have various puzzles contained within. There are multiple goals possible with a puzzle room. One goal may be that the door shuts behind the player and they must solve the puzzle in order to unlock the doors again and maneuver through the rest of the dungeon. Another goal may be to make it to a chest that requires solving the puzzle to reach. Puzzles will include a wide assortment of different mechanics such as pushing and pulling blocks, triggering pressure buttons, activating objects in a certain order, and much more. Combat Rooms These rooms work by having the doors lock the player in the room and the player will need to clear all monsters in the room to have the doors unlocked. My goal here is to create interesting combat challenges, so hopefully it's not just a bunch of rooms filled with random monsters that you just need to mindlessly defeat. There can be a mixture of obstacles, puzzles, and monster fighting all in a single combat room. Obstacle Rooms These rooms are primarily designed to provide a challenge for the player to navigate through. This could include all sorts of traps, moving hazards, pits, dexterity, and timing challenges. The goal with these rooms is mainly just to get to the other side, but sometimes can also have special items such as keys that you need to reach and pick up in order to unlock other dungeon rooms. Walkthrough Rooms These rooms are a bit of a break from the other challenging rooms, and in here you'll find some various items to help you on your dungeon trials such as extra arrows, bombs, clues, or even some interesting visuals or lore to take in. Boss Rooms These are the final rooms in the dungeon and work much like the combat room. The doors will again lock you inside and you'll need to face off with a very strong monster or multiple monsters. These rooms will always be locked and require a special boss key you can find somewhere in the dungeon. Defeating a boss will drop a chest, which can contain one or several valuable or rare items. An exit will also appear, allowing the player to warp back to the entrance to the dungeon. So once I established which types of rooms I wanted, it was pretty easy to designate all of the generated rooms to specific room types. The first room in the path is always the entry room, and the last room in the path is always the boss room, so those are easy to set. I then randomly assign room types to the remaining rooms. The next step is to actually create locked rooms and locations for keys. Because the dungeon layouts are random, I had to be careful with where keys were placed. If a key was placed farther in the path behind a locked room, it would be impossible for the player to actually get to the room to obtain the key. So I just had the script pick rooms farther into the path to lock, and made sure that there were enough rooms ahead in the path to accommodate the number of keys needed to unlock everything. Finally, I made sure to lock the boss room and place the boss key somewhere else in the dungeon. The end result is a nice random dungeon layout with locked rooms and rooms that will contain keys. But this is just a layout there's still no actual dungeon level being generated. So then comes the more challenging aspect of actually generating the levels to accommodate the layout. Dungeon rooms are 20 by 20 tiles in size. I chose this size because I felt like it was a good enough space to explore without feeling too small or too large. Because I need to design puzzles and obstacles, having a really large room means I either have to create a massive puzzle or obstacle course for a single room, or I need to fill the room with a lot of dead space. Smaller rooms mean I can focus more on interesting designs and it creates a bit more of a claustrophobic atmosphere. So I went about creating a basic dungeon tile set so I could generate a simple room with four surrounding walls. 
Initially, I played around with different perspectives for the walls. I thought maybe having only the northmost wall showing would be a neat look, and it sort of fits with how caves are set up. However, a problem with this design quickly rose up as I was drawing the doors because, well, how do you represent doors that are on the east, west, or south walls? If you can't see the wall, you can't see the door. Now sure, I could hint at a door by creating an indent or something to show that it's a possible entry or exit point, but then I'd also need to come up with some method of showing that it's locked, unlocked, or open, and maybe that could be done with some type of lock symbol on top of the doorway, but it just felt like a hacked on solution. It totally makes sense why the old classic top-down Zelda dungeons are designed in a way where all four walls have the same perspective, because it easily solves this problem by allowing the player to see all of the walls, meaning they can see all of the doors and what types of doors they are. So after some fussing about, I finally just decided it would be much easier for me to create walls like that, so that's what I chose to use. It's not surprising to me that Nintendo used this type of perspective because it makes the most sense as a solution to this sort of problem. Once I had a tile set created and door graphics created for various door types, I needed to actually generate the rooms. So using the procedural dungeon script I had created previously, I just took the room layout data from that script and plugged it into a room generation script. I first loaded in empty rooms with four walls for every room of the dungeon. I decided I didn't want to manually add doors to every custom design room I created because to me it just made more sense to handle doors during the room generation instead. So I went about adding a script which just cuts out the walls where doorways need to be placed. Once I got this working, I now had an empty dungeon layout I could navigate through in the game. Of course, at this point there are no actual doors, and the rooms are empty and I don't have types yet, but it was a good foundation to build on. I went ahead and created a dungeon door prefab and implemented the code to place all of these door prefabs in the empty tile spaces and set them up to show the proper door and either be locked or unlocked by default. I had to get creative with how the player can walk between rooms, and I'm not certain if I want to let the player freely roam in between the doorways or do some sort of automated thing where once the player enters far enough into a doorway, it just automatically walks to the other side of the doorway, but for now they can freely walk through. The next task is to actually populate the rooms with various objects and also design different layouts for rooms. I actually started creating a bunch of room layout templates that I can later load in to further customize for each type of room that I want to make. For example, I have different available room layout templates for different door orientations. If we have a room with doors on all four sides, I created a bunch of layouts that can accommodate all four doors. If we have a room that only has doors on the north and south walls, I can create a special layout specifically for that type of room, such as a narrow corridor or a shape that doesn't necessitate walls at the left or right edges of the room. Since I already have a tile editor created for the rest of the game, it was fairly easy to just add the dungeon tile set and place down tiles as needed. But for building custom levels, this was actually an entirely new feature I needed to add. This is because up until this point, all of the objects in Cloudscape were being procedurally generated on world creation. For example, on the player's starting island, all of the trees, rocks, grass, and other objects are all placed randomly. I didn't have to hand place down anything in a level editor, so I didn't have a need to do that. The same for inside of caves where rocks and ore nodes are randomly placed. Because I want cohesive dungeon rooms, I need to actually handcraft those rooms and not rely on procedural generation, because that would result in either needing to spend a year of development time working out AI smart enough to design its own puzzles and obstacles, or I could just hack something together and it would result in a really bad puzzle and impossible obstacles. So knowing I need to hand design a lot of dungeon rooms, I needed to build out my editor so that it could handle placing down all sorts of objects. Now, if I'm being honest, I already started working on this a bit because I was initially developing the Limbo Realm, and since that is also a handcrafted area, I was beginning to lay the foundation for building that out. But I pivoted over to dungeon stuff, so I needed to revisit what I had done and add onto it extensively. I first needed to create a scrolling box with a grid of available objects I could pick from to place down in the level. This took a bit of time because I honestly have never dealt with scroll bars and interfaces inside of Unity before, so a little learning was necessary to get something working. Once I was able to place down some simple objects, I quickly realized I needed to add quite a bit more to the tools in order to actually use them. I needed to be able to delete objects that I placed and also click on them to lift them up and move them around and reposition them. So I actually spent a couple of days adding this because it wasn't as simple as just typing in delete object into my code. Since the objects in my game get generated through an object pooler, I needed to make sure whenever I deleted an object, I also properly added it back to the pool and reset its values. I had to do this for around 8 different object types, but once I got it all working, I was now able to click and place objects and also delete them. Moving them was another tricky task. I may go back and change this, but at the moment when I click on an object to move it, it will actually remove the object entirely and then just place a proxy of it at the mouse cursor. This works great for not having any of the object's code or collision boxes interfering as I move the object around, but I'm not sure it's the best solution because I do need to keep track of all the deleted object's properties so I can reassign them when I place the object back down elsewhere. I'm still figuring this one out, but for now it at least works. 
So now I can place down, remove, and reposition objects. Great, except I can't really modify the objects if I need to. For example, maybe I want to place down a torch, but I want the torch to be lit. I could just make two objects in the level editor, which would be a torch and a lit torch, but this seems very limiting and would get very messy if an object has multiple properties that can be set. So I took a page out of the Unity book and decided why not just create property panels like Unity does for game object components. All I needed to do was figure out what components are attached to any particular object, grab only the necessary values that can be modified, and then display those in the editor with a way to modify them. I ended up doing exactly that, and now when I middle click an object in the scene, its property panel will load in and display all of the relevant properties for that object type. I can modify the property and have it instantly update for the object. The first thing I set up to take advantage of this was the push button and floor barricade. Basically I wanted an object that when triggered would activate an entirely different object. I thought for a while about how I could link the two objects together without creating some sort of hard reference between them. Since I give every custom game object a unique ID for saving and loading purposes, I decided why not just use that ID as a way to link two objects together. So how this works is I can first middle click the button object to see what object ID it has. I can then go and middle click the floor barricade object and change the trigger ID to the same value as that button object's ID. This way, via code, I can have it so when the player or a specific type of object calls the trigger stay 2 d method on the button, it can reach out to that floor barricade object and run a method to trigger it. So with a single value change, I can link one object to another. What's really great about this is I can go ahead and just change the trigger ID on multiple objects to the same ID and they will all get triggered by a single object. In the future I plan to make it possible for objects to trigger other objects in a chain, so you could have it where you need to push down several buttons to trigger an object or even in a certain order. Having these floor buttons was great, however the only way to activate them was to have the player step on them. I hadn't set up a toggle for the buttons as of yet, so they only triggered while being stepped on. The next thing I wanted to add was something that could keep the button pressed down without the player being there. So I added the classic push and pull blocks to complement the floor buttons. These work as you'd expect them to. There are three types of blocks, each designated by a specific color and pattern on top of the block. Green is a push block with arrows pointing inward indicating the block can only be pushed and not pulled. Blue is a pull block with arrows pointing outward indicating the block can only be pulled. Red is a push and pull block and is represented by diamonds to indicate multi-directional movement. It took a bit of work to figure out exactly how I would actually have the player go about manipulating these blocks. Initially I thought since my game has physics set up already, I could just make the blocks rigid bodies and the player could freely push them around. But of course that not only makes it difficult to pull them, since the moment you walk up to it you'd start shoving it away, but it also makes it extremely difficult for the player to properly align blocks to solve puzzles that are meant to be in a grid. For example, if I could just push the green block around freely from a grid, I could end up getting it stuck in a weird spot where I couldn't actually push it between two obstacles properly. I didn't want the player having to fiddle with positioning blocks delicately just to solve simple puzzles, so going with the grid movement method seemed like a much better choice. So with that, I needed to create code to move the blocks one space over depending on if they are pushed or pulled. So in the code, I have to do some checks to make sure the block can actually occupy the space it's being moved to. For pushing, this means the space on the other side of the block. For pulling, this means I need to check the space behind the player because the player needs somewhere to go when they pull the block into the space they are currently occupying. I also realized I would need to create a grab animation and code in interaction for grabbing onto boxes. This is because the player needs to initially grab the box in order to press a direction to determine whether they are pushing or pulling the block. Otherwise there would be no way for the player to actually pull a block by simply standing next to it because pressing the opposite direction would mean the player would just walk away from the block. Luckily I didn't need to create entirely new animations for this as I could just borrow from the existing lift object animation I created which has the player outstretching their arms in front of them. So I put together a grab animation and adding in the interaction. Now when pressing and holding the action key near a block, the player will reach out and hold onto it. Then by simply pressing a direction, they can push or pull the proper type of block by one grid space at a time. Now that it's functional, I decided to not bother with polishing it any further. I still need to add pushing and pulling animations for the player as they walk backward or forward, and also reposition the player during the push since right now they just stand in place instead of falling behind the block. I'd also like to add some sweat drops coming off the player when they attempt to pull a push block or push a pull block in order to visually display they can't do that action. But for now they work, so I'm happy with them so far. Finally I needed to add the blocks to the on trigger stay code for the button, and at the end result is now you can push blocks onto the button to trigger them and they will stay down. After doing this I quickly added a retractable floor spike trap which can also be triggered as well. This works exactly like the barricade but also has the added feature of damaging the player if they touch it while it's popped out. The final object I decided to tackle right now for the dungeons was quite possibly the most challenging thing to implement so far. I wanted to add a dangerous obstacle that could move around, just a pointy spiky block that can damage the player. 
However, I want this to actually make sense in the game world. I couldn't just have it randomly float around magically, I wanted to make sure it was more mechanical. So my idea was to create tracks on the floor which these types of objects could fit in, and the tracks would carry the objects around the room along the path of the tracks. The first step was to create the track sprites and figure out all of the pieces I needed to make. Then I created a new tread prefab and a new script that works a lot like the fences. Basically this script uses a sort of tile bit masking to check the adjacent objects and update the sprite to properly connect them all together visually. This way I can just plop down the same tread object and it automatically connects the treads together. Once I had this set up, I still needed to actually figure out a way to get something moving along the tracks. I played around with a handful of ideas and did a bit of research. At first I thought surface effectors could be promising, then realized since these tracks aren't solid objects I'd have to use the area effector. But after a very short time experimenting with it, I realized it wasn't really a good fit for the project, mainly because it wouldn't be easy to control objects on the treads. I couldn't securely place an object directly on the center of the track and then have it properly twist and turn at angles because the area effector merely checks collision boxes and instantly moves objects in a direction. So the moment an object even touches the edge of the tread, it would start pulling it along. Another massive problem with this method is that the objects sitting on the treads would need it to have a dynamic rigid body in order for it to be affected by the effector. But then that means the player could just walk up and push the object off the track as well, unless I then set up a specific collider to ignore the player pushing the object but not ignore the player if it needs to damage them, and this was just getting really convoluted. I figured the best solution would be to simply add all of the movement code inside the object that was meant to move. All I needed to do is check for treads underneath the mover object. If a tread existed, it would just identify the type of tread it was and use that to determine what direction to move and how fast to move. For example, if the mover was on top of a tread that moved to the right, then the mover would know to move itself one block to the right of that tread. Once it reached that one block over, it would then check for another tread below it and repeat the process. This basically means whenever the mover is on top of a tread object, it's always trying to shift itself over to the next available tread on the ground. This also makes the mover entirely dynamic. I can add treads in front of the mover or delete a tread to change up the track, and the mover updates automatically to handle the new shape. There were a couple more problems to solve with this however. Mainly, I needed a way to tell the mover what directions it should move in. Initially I thought, okay, just add a variable to the tread object, telling the mover to go left, right, up, or down. This creates a lot of issues however, because now the treads are influencing the mover, even though the mover was already moving on its own accord before. It also means I'd need to create two sets of tracks that could visually indicate what direction they are moving in. This is just extra work I wanted to avoid. This also would have meant it would have been a lot harder to have an object move back and forth along the same track, since each tread would be telling the mover to go one specific direction. So instead I gave the mover object its own rotational variable. This just tells the mover object if it should move in a clockwise or counterclockwise pattern. So basically if it's given the choice, should it move up and left or down and right? I then added another variable for bouncing. When it's zero, if the object reaches a dead end in a track, it will simply stop there and not move any further. At negative one, the object will reverse direction forever, so it can just bounce back and forth between a stretch of track with two dead ends. Later on, I want to implement it so that the value is greater than zero, it will bounce once and then subtract from the value down to zero. This could create a situation where an object would have a limited number of bounces before it simply stopped bouncing off of dead ends. So far so good, I can put down multiple movers on tracks and have them going all over the place. That's great, but they pass right through each other. There's no collision detection between the mover objects. So I went about adding that detection, which involves needing to check at the edge of the mover objects for other mover objects, while also ignoring itself in the detection. Then I can just have the objects that collide both perform their bounce method. If they are meant to simply stop, they will stop on each other, but if they are meant to reverse direction, they will bounce off each other in a satisfying way. I also needed to include the attachments on the movers in the collision setup because it's possible to disable attachments on the four sides of the mover. This allows for varying up the spikes to only be on particular sides or no sides at all. With no spikes, the player can just get shoved around. This can be used for obstacles where players could get shoved off into a pit by a mover object. I also needed to add damage to the player when they touch the pointy bits, but that was pretty straightforward and I just used the same code I used elsewhere for damaging the player and knocking them back. That's all for the dungeon generation so far. I'm really happy with all these new features I've managed to add in a relatively short amount of time. The end goal of all of this is to create some really fun and interesting dungeons that are always new and different. The great thing about a lot of these new objects is that I can make small modifications to them and use them in a variety of ways. The treads could easily be minecart tracks and I could create a mover that works as a minecart, which could either store items for quick delivery to another location or even transport the player around on the tracks. Push buttons could be placed by the player to trigger all sorts of things such as lights, various machines, doors, or whatever else can be interacted with. This opens up a lot of possibilities possibilities for players to be creative with these objects to have them interact in all sorts of different ways. I've made a lot of strides with the level editor which will definitely be used throughout the entire project. 
The editor is still rough and doesn't look super appealing, but I do plan to polish it and add more features to it over time as I come across the need for them. This video ran a little longer than usual, but I really just wanted to go a bit into detail on each feature I added, so I hope you enjoyed what I've shared. If you like the video and want to support the game's development, consider subscribing to the channel and dropping a like on this video. I have 12 more devlog videos before this one, so if you're new here, there's a lot of content to check out. You can find a link to the first and previous devlogs at the end of this video. Also, if you really want to go the extra mile to support the game's development, consider pre-ordering the game on Backerkit. You can get the game for PC or console, and there's an assortment of physical goodies to pre-order order as well. All of that money goes into helping fund the remainder of the game's development. Every little bit counts. You can even donate without buying anything if you really want to. A link to the backer kit store is in the description below. With that, I hope you've enjoyed this devlog and I promise there's plenty more to come. As always, thanks for watching.